Bookworm Games, episode 14, I Wish You Luck. This is Wesley Schantz. Welcome back. I hope to catch up with Stephen tomorrow, and we'll have episode 13 for you. Scintillating conversation, capping off three winters in Saturn Valley's chapters from last month. But I did want to stick with my numbering, despite missing a week. I think it works out well to have episode 13 be the temporarily lost one and move us along into the next tercet, Dusty Dunes Desert, Foreside, Moonside. On to the desert. Beginning with your return to Threed, after defeating Belch and adding the third of the eight melodies to your soundstone, with the encouragement of the coffee break by the hot springs, that voice, different from any other in the game, something like the people of Saturn Valley speaking their own curious lingo, different from any other. That voice of some grown-up and concerned speaker whose last words linger in your mind, and the ellipse at the end of those like the fermata on a note of music. I wish you luck. Dot, dot, dot. Just as lucky of the Runaway Five let you know they believed in you as they dropped you off in the dark, that you'd bring your own sunshine to the place. And so it is. The sun is shining once more in Threed, and another variation on the theme song has taken the place of the menacing Zombies Ate My Neighbors vibe from before. The townspeople are free to visit their family and friends in the graveyard once more. They greet you there with gratitude when you emerge from the still spooky but empty now glowing underground path. They cheer you on in the circus tent too, where the last of the zombies are safely caged. They blame you as they go pacing out their quote-unquote life like senators from the south. And there are plenty of hints that you'll be back to visit the sky, to fix the Skyrunner at some point. But instead for now, it's another bus that you'll take to leave Threed. Reading the bus stop sign, it turns out it's a schedule. And in lieu of actually reporting the times, if you read it from off of the road, the game tells you it looks like a bus is arriving. And it's yet another small way in which reading causes something to happen in this game. This bus may say gray hand, but it looks kind of like easy hand. The lettering is hard to discern. It barrels eastward with you, with jangling jazz music and the ghost-free tunnels, and a little patch of valley that's colored like threed in the daytime, before emerging in the glare of the desert, drawing to a halt. The driver lets you off at the end of the world's longest traffic jam and peels out backwards. Someone else thinks there's a herd of buffalo crossing ahead, but gradually the crescendo of traffic noises gives way to the dusty dunes music, upbeat harmonica, not unlike the way that at the opening of the game, on booting it up, you transition from a catastrophic overture to a scene of UFOs death-raying gas stations, to the confident horns of the title displaying the word Earthbound. The game, too, is a respite from life's traffic jams, from the daily grind, and it takes the form of this roundabout adventure. You might recall Itoi's Easter egg story of the speeding driver pulled over, that you find between the couch cushions in the seaside property back in Onet. You might recall the strangeness of the bike ride, the sky runner which showed you glimpses of the desert and the city beyond, the bus rides with the runaway five and this one stuck in traffic, and it begins to look like there's legs to this metaphor of travel, especially unorthodox travel that's driving the game. The strategy guide is a travel guidebook, our life is a pilgrimage, yada, yada. Or what about this? Taking an ordinary gripe, traffic, which represents a curious paradox whereby something that's good in itself becomes terribly disfigured by attracting too much popularity. 
especially when this happens at a beautiful or desirable place which is destroyed by the masses of people attracted to that life-changing potential. And clearly the solution is to see how much more of the place there is all around, including where you already are. That seems to be the message of Paulo Coelho's Alchemist, a good book about a journey through the desert. That you need to walk around in this place, and not just look at it from the car or the tour bus, as you stop and then go to your next destination, the big city of Forside. But in the desert, earthbound for all its modernity, takes the step of forcing you out of the vehicle, and instead of waiting for the traffic to clear up like everyone else, it sends you out into the dusty dunes, though all the parts you can reach seem pretty flat. The religious traditions of the West agree. The desert, literal and spiritual, is where you go for visions, literal as mirages, and metaphorical as ladders, for instance, or dry bones. But rather than Abrahamic scripture or New Agey inspiration, I thought I'd go for more classic 20th century literature this week. Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, he of the little prince. So stay hydrated, we'll see if we get there. In the desert, you recall from that flyover from Winters, there's a monkey hanging out by an oasis. And when you meet her, she explains that as there are sea monkeys in the sea, desert monkeys live in the desert. Did I say desert? I meant dessert. But there's something going on with that monkey slip, since it's dessert in the unexpected form of the trout-flavored yogurt machine, if trout-flavored yogurt is a dessert, which brings you back to the desert later. Close to the drugstore, helpfully labeled with the sign DRUGS, is a cave of forking paths, each covered by a monkey with a specific craving. And often enough, they're guarding the very item desired by one of the other guards, some of which cannot be found any other way. But for now, the way in is blocked by Tala Rama, who is also at the end of the maze later, once you need that yogurt machine. And he'll throw in a stumper of a discourse on predetermination and offer you the power of teleportation as well. For now, though, he's in deep meditation and won't respond. Some luck so far. First, a traffic jam, now this stonewalling, deterministic guru floating in your way. Anyway, when you do get to that part of the game, everyday foodstuffs, picnic lunches, and bread rolls, rather than the bare cipher that equates to a round amount of hit points, labeled tonic or potion. This is the sort of thing that the monkey cave may make you think about, along with the strangeness of food represented by the yogurt dispenser. And caramels would restore psychic points. Ketchup on the burger would boost its effectiveness. There are double burgers scattered around in gift boxes when you initially stop for the traffic jam, like manna in the desert. The first thing you notice in stepping off the road into the sand, though, is the sweat springing from your party's faces. But there is life in the desert, it turns out. Besides the monkeys and the levitating sage, and the couple suntanning and the bones which tell you they don't talk, a whole drama unfolds with what is normally not alive, and what is normally not important either. A black sesame seed, a white sesame seed, and a lost contact lens. As you trek up and down the wasteland, searching for treasure, you are rewarded with unexpected finds. Specks of pixels, which speak to you if you investigate them, and tell you their stories, and you in turn become their messenger, carrying the news from the black sesame seed to the white one, and back again, that though they are apart, they still love one another. Certainly, if there is anything in the game that cues us not to make too much of it, this would be up there, along with the insignificant item from the hospital drawer, it's a maudlin romance between sesame seeds lost in the sand, with nothing aside from its absurd humor to show for your effort. Finding the shiny contact lens, at least, promises some tangible reward from the delightfully named Giovanni Penatella, living on the second floor of the Forside Bakery. 
We'll have to wait and see what that could be. One thing that such events certainly conspire against, however, is the sense of necessity. Instead, with the implication of incredible odds against finding two seeds and a single contact lens in the desert, these events point towards luck, or even something miraculous. Of course, in another sense, Tala Rama is literally correct. The whole game is predetermined, namely by that voice which speaks directly to you in the coffee break and possesses that dog back in Onet where his short story is hidden by the game developer. And yet there is someone else determining what takes place in the game too, and that's you, the player. And it is practically impossible to imagine ever playing the game through quite the same way twice. There are just too many contingencies, and effectively infinite paths through the desert or through all the other terrains of the game. And so, despite being in one way wholly determined, there's, an all, there's another sense in which there's always room for what is natural to call chance, or luck, if you're lucky. And balancing out Tala Rama and the monkey's cave on the far side of the desert and similarly concealing treasure is another cave belonging to a miner. He, like Apple Kid, has so devoted himself to his work that he is famished. Will you feed him? Of course you will. This is one of those choices which you can only choose one way in order to continue to play the game. And in return for your generosity, the miner promises to give you whatever he finds. For now, there's nothing more to do in the cave. Later, of course, you'll have to clear out the third strongest moles, all five of them, in what has become a tedious maze full of monsters. These two caves, taken together, might suggest two opposing alternatives to the desert of boredom and angst and anomia, of meditation on the one hand and mammon on the other. And each element here, the traffic and the desert and the caves and the space between them, the apparent randomness of the seeds and the contact lens, this could all also point attention to the modern predicament which is responsible for the game's existence in the first place, namely that tedium itself. And though the game exists to allay it, it can't at times help but propagate it. At times it seems the jokes fall flat or the enemies are too repetitive, and for crying out loud, there's a pencil-shaped statue at the end of the cave. Are you kidding me? You have to walk all the way back out and call on the phone and get your pencil eraser, and so on. Or, or is it that these jokes and this boredom and tedium that it inspires can hit all too close to home? The sesame seeds are like us black and white, loving despite being disconnected from community and seeking connection. Or maybe we're like Giovanni Penatella, hoping someone will restore what we've lost against all odds. Though it's only something material as it may be, it lets us see, and it has sentimental value besides being handed down in the family, as we'll learn. Almost through the desert, and no buffalo herd in sight, just off the now clear road, you'll find the broken slot machine and its friends, the Sanchez brothers, Pincho, Pancho, and Tomas Hefferson. As many times as I've played the game, I've never won anything from them, except when all the spots in my inventory were full, and then when they try to bring over my prize, they let me know, unfortunately, it's impossible to give me anything else to carry. And unlike at the end of a battle, when you have the chance to pick something up, you have no option of getting rid of something first, or, say, using one of your items to free up space. So these Sanchez brothers, what are they doing in the desert, spinning in place like whirling dervishes or imaginary casinos? Their pockets are full of mysterious prizes that they offer only to travelers whose backpacks are full. 
Their names allude vaguely to a huge swath of the Western world long colonized politically and economically, to brotherhood, to Sancho Panza, and thus vaguely to sanctity, and also, and his name seems to be the punchline, to the founding father whose words, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness have resounded down through history alongside his slave-owning and his Louisiana purchase, which made conflict with neighboring peoples all but inevitable. But they're just another joke, I suppose. Here's saint Exupéry. He says, I have no regrets. I have gambled and lost. It was all in the day's work. At least I have had the unforgettable taste of the sea on my lips. This comes from the chapter Prisoner of the Sand in the translation of his book Terre de Homme, which is literally land of men, or man's land, I guess. It's translated as wind, sand, and stars. In this book he recounts the experience of surviving a crash landing in the Sahara, and this would later become the basis for his children's classic, Le Petit Prince, The Little Prince. He survives, it turns out, because of that wind carrying the moisture from the sea, though its atmospheric effects also caused his confusion, which led to the crash. But this northeast wind, this abnormal wind that had blown us out of our course, sorry, off our course, and had marooned us on this plateau, was now prolonging our lives. What was the length of the reprieve it would grant us before our eyes began to fill with light? I went forward with the feeling of a man canoeing in mid-ocean. That's from the same chapter. And I don't know if this leap makes sense, but here's the analogy I see. You tell me if it's a mirage or a true vision. That crash landing culminates in the vision of his fellow man, the Arab who rescues him as divine, seeing a human being as divine. And those fennec foxes he speaks of who live in the desert will become the unforgettable fox of the little prince who never lets go of a question. This is in chapter 21 of that book. C'est alors qu'apparu le renard. Bonjour, dit le renard. Bonjour, répondit poliment le petit prince, qui se retournant mais ne vit rien. Je suis là, dit la voix, sur le pommier. Qui es-tu, dit le petit prince. Tu es bien joli. Je suis un renard, dit le renard. « Viens jouer avec moi, lui proposa le petit prince. Je suis tellement triste. Je ne puis pas jouer avec toi, dit le renard. Je ne suis pas à Brovisois. »« Ah, pardon, fit le petit prince. » Mais après réflexion, il ajouta, « Qu'est-ce que signifiait « apprivoiser ?»« Tu n'es pas d'ici, dit le renard. » Que cherches-tu? Je cherche les hommes, dit le petit prince. Qu'est-ce que signifiait apprivoiser? Les hommes, dit le renard. Ils ont des fusils et ils chassent. C'est bien gênant. Ils élèvent ainsi des poules. C'est le seul intérêt. Tu cherches des poules? Non, dit le petit prince. Je cherche des amis. Qu'est-ce que signifiait « apprivoiser »?« C'est une chose trop oubliée, » dit le renard. « Ça signifiait créer des liens. »« Créer des liens. » So that part, I don't have my book with me, but I'll try to translate. It's then that the fox appears. « Hello, » said the fox. « Hello, » responded politely the petit prince, the little prince, uh, who turned but didn't see anything. « I'm there, » said the voice. Under the tree. Maybe it's an apple tree? Not sure. What are you? said the little prince. You're very lovely. I am a fox, said the fox. Come play with me, proposed the little prince. I am so sad. 
I cannot play with you, said the fox. I am not tamed. Oh, beg your pardon, said the little prince. But after reflecting, he added, What is it that, that means to tame? You're not from here, said the fox. What are you looking for? I'm looking for men, said the little prince. People. What is it that it means to tame? The men, said the fox, they have guns and they hunt. It's very annoying. They also raise chickens, and that's their only interest. That's the only interesting thing about them. Are you looking for chickens? No, said the little prince. I'm looking for friends. What is it that it means to tame? It is a thing too much forgotten, said the fox. It means to create bonds to form bonds asked the prince so where were we yeah the horrors of the 20th century let's make it this connection again like the longest traffic jam in the world or the worst crash landing so far have led to much searching in the desert and it looks to me at any rate to finding much that is worth treasuring I'd like to just recap a little bit here. We covered what I take to be one of the more tiresome parts of the game when all's taken into account with the monkey cave of Talarama and the mine, which you have to return to after making it to Foresight at last. Um, but I think that we can turn up some interesting stuff there in the desert along with a few double burgers and... Uh, a few living things, a few stories whose qualities seem to escape, to me at any rate, reduction to deterministic values and to offer a glimpse at least of something transcendent, whether it's a mirage or not, I suppose is up to the person who's playing. And thanks again for listening. I look forward to telling you more next week. Uh, about my conversation with Stephen, which is certainly going to happen soon, and then we'll move on to Foreside and Moonside. And until then, take care. The podcast you just heard was recorded with Anchor. If you want to make your own, download the Android or iOS app completely free from anchor.fm slash podcast. That's anchor.fm slash podcast.